Happy Mother's Day, I want to say. I think that's the greatest honor that God can give us is blessing us with children to be able to raise. Nothing better to understand the kingdom of God than being entrusted with uh, taking care of little ones. So I have Linda's going to, you're going to bless me, Linda. Do you guys know when, when the, I'm going to preach a lot about our Jewish roots. I love the Jewish roots. I'm Jewish, and I, I think Linda must have some Jewish blood in her. She sure seems like it. Anyhow, when they gathered together, one of the things they always did, the Israelites, when they, whenever they gathered together, they blew the shofar, and it breaks through the spirit. So bless us, Linda. Can you still feel the power in that? I mean, thousands of years later, with all the technology we have, and God created something so powerful to break through the heavens. Because he doesn't want us to be trapped here. He wants us to be able to, to make it into that heavenly realm. The message that the Lord has laid on my heart today, there's going to be a lot to it, so strap it on your seatbelts and get ready. You're probably going to just have to take notes on this later on because I have a lot of scripture and I have a lot of information that God wants to do. But let's just bless God's word. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. Lord, to hear your word and to discern your word. And Father, I thank you that your word is alive. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing between joint and marrow, setting us free. Lord, I thank you. Your word is alive. It's active. And, Lord, that you would activate that into us, Father God. That you'd set us free, that your word would not come back void, but it will do its intended purpose in each of us here. So we give you permission in that in Jesus' name. So I want to I preach about the, the, the um, upper room, the, an Acts on the day of Pentecost. But before we could get to that day 2,000 years ago when that, there was an outpouring of God's spirit, we need to know what Pentecost is. Because Pentecost did not happen that day. The first time there was a Pentecost was on Mount, Mount Sinai. When Moses went up to the mountain of the Lord to have an encounter with God and to get the Ten Commandments. And the Jewish people have said, that is Pentecost. That is the gift. That was the day that God entered into covenant with a group of people. And if we don't understand that, we are not going to understand Pentecost. I mean, we read it, we say, oh, we're a Pentecostal church. You know, it's Pentecost Sunday. We could say that word, but do we know what Pentecost means? And even to go deeper than that, if we go into and we study about the first day of Pentecost, Shavuot, the first one, we need to understand the Jewish culture of that time. We need to understand how they lived, the symbolism of the day. And the greatest thing of all, I think, is the marriage covenant of that time of the Jewish people. And if we don't understand that, we are missing everything. And, we, you know, people know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, he will prophesy fully. We only know in part. And this is just another revelation in the peace of what God has been showing me. So first of all, I just want to go through, and I want to give our PowerPoint person, Charles Grace, I'll tell you, because I, I have lots of stuff, and it's, and it's probably not going to be very organized because I just go where God goes. All right, I want to first teach you some basic points of a Jewish wedding. The first thing is a mikvah, if we could show the mikvah. So the first thing is there is a mikvah. If you've ever heard of the word mikvah, that's like a baptism. That's going to be part, so be aware. When you hear mikvah, that was part of the ceremonial preparation before the bride would be you know, given to the groom, they would both be separated and they would receive a mikvah. The Jewish culture today, they still do that in preparation for their wedding day. Another part of a, a wedding ceremony is the, the hoopla. The hoopla was always a very big symbol. It was the covering. And the bride and the groom would be underneath the hoopla and they would make their marriage vows. And it was a symbol of God's covering, God's protection over them. Another part of the marriage uh, ceremony would be the ketubah. The ketubah was the contract. The ketubah was something that 
you would go into the, uh, the, the bride's family's home. They would make a contract. They would make a covenant. The father would sign it, and both parties would receive a covenant. And at that time, you were, it was binding. It was a binding agreement with stipulations, but it was binding at that moment. That's the ketubah. There was another part of the marriage ceremony, which was the sign. There would be some kind of a sign that God had blessed this in the marriage. And that's another part of it. Another part of it, too, would be, I don't, I don't think I have a PowerPoint for that, was, was the, the cup. And when the groom would propose to the bride, he would offer her a cup, just like Jesus offered the cup of communion. And if the bride received the cup and she drank from the cup, that was her saying, yes, you know, I'm going to enter into covenant with you and I'm going to accept you. So that was another part of that. Another uh, part was the price. You probably remember the story of, you know, Isaac and he sent his servant to go get a bride for our, yeah, Jacob would have sent uh, somebody for Isaac to go get a bride and they got, and they met Rebecca at the well there. And what did they say? That they, they gave her a dowry. They gave her the price of a bride. They gave gifts. That part of that is that there's a price that's paid, but there's also gifts that are given whenever there's a, a marriage ceremony that went on. Let's see, in Genesis 34, 12, it talks about, too, um, somebody really wanted uh, one of Jacob's daughters, and it says, make the price for the bride and the gift. I am, it's say, I'm supposed to bring as great as you like. And they were just saying, we want this bride. Make whatever price you want it to be. I am going to pay for that. So that was another part of it. So now we're going to get into, now that we have a little bit of background about what a, a Jewish marriage ceremony is about, we're going to go to Mount Sinai. And this is in Exodus 19. So what we've seen is the Israelites have been in slavery. They've been in abusive situation. They're entrapped. They're crying out. They're, they're wanting a deliverer. They're wanting a God to save them and, and, you know, bring them out of their captivity. So God's supernatural outstretched hand delivers them from Egypt, delivers them from the, you know, all the oppression, supernaturally takes them across, you know, and divides the, the Red Sea. And now we're at this place here at Mount Sinai. And this, again, this is the first Pentecost. We've got to see that that way. Because then we'll understand what Pentecost was in Acts. Okay, so we see that um, the scenario, if we look at what a wedding would be like and compare this to the wedding, and we see in 19.5 it talks about, now if you obey my, me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. And it was more like a crown with the most sacred ruby or jewel that was in the crown. That's what Israel was going to be to God, that you are my apple of my eye. You are my chosen one. It's a, it's a love language that he's speaking. In verse 14, it says, and Moses had gone down the mountain to the people. He consecrated them and he had them wash their clothes and prepare. And he wanted them to bathe. Does that sound like a mikvah? He wanted them to wash. He wanted them to bathe because they were going to be in preparation of having an encounter with the living God. So God said, have a mikvah. Even there's a Joel Richardson. He is uh, somebody that's gone to Mount Sinai. And he said, there's places where you could see where they've had mikvahs there, where there, there's been that. So all of a sudden we see, it says, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder, there was lightning, and there was a thick cloud. Now, th these clouds were not normal clouds. You know, sometimes you could go out and, and when it's cloudy and you get sunburn, right? It's not those kind of clouds. These clouds were so thick that it protected them from the sun. Does that sound like a hoopla, right? The covering that was over them. And it was almost like a mushroom cloud, they said. It was, it was huge. It covered all of the Israelite people. It was a hoopla. It was a covering after they had, they had been immersed it says, and it was over the mountain, and there was very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp was trembling. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. So with, it says that Mount Sinai, it was covered with smoke. 
because God, the Lord, descended on it with fire. Does that almost sound like the upper room? Did, they, did something happen there that day? Was there a pillar of fire that descended on the room? This is the first Pentecost. Acts is another Pentecost. The same type thing is going on. The smoke billowed up like the smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently, and the sounds of trumpets grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and it spoke, and the voice of God answered him. Can you just imagine that? But it's very similar, similar in some ways of that upper room experience. You, it talks about the crying, the travailing, the sounds that were going on. I mean, this was all inclusive, sight and sounds to the max. I mean, you have smell, sound, feeling, everything around you, there was, there was, it was stimulating in that. So he goes up there and he gets the Ten Commandments. And remember when we talked about the marriage agreement, the ketubah, ketubah. The ketubah was the contract. That was the written agreement that God is binding. And there's usually two copies. Moses went up and did get two copies, but one of them kind of got broken. But that's another story. Um, but he went up there, and if we think of it, okay, we could sit there and say, thou shall not, and thou shall not this. We look at the Ten Commandments, and some people are like, oh, it's, it's a law. But if we look at it like, you should have no other gods before me. You know, think of our marriage vows. You know, till death do us part. That I'll, there'll be no others. I'll have nothing else to get in the way of you and me. It's a covenant that they were entering into with God. It was a marriage covenant. And if we look at it that way, and again, it, it's just such a different perspective if you understand the culture, what God was doing there that day. He was entering into covenant. So we could say God was marrying Israel that day. Another part of the marriage uh, uh, ceremony would be the um, matan. Now, the matan is called the gift. And actually, with Shavuot, the uh, Feast of Pentecost, it, it really stems from the gift. They use that. The Israelites use that, the gift, the matan. And I'm going to read, I don't know if anybody's gotten to read this, the Book of Mysteries. And in here, what we see is, it says, the day of the matan. So again, the matan, I'm going to read what it is. The matan, it's the gift. The matan was a sign of the bridegroom's love for the bride. It was to encourage her in the days of separation, to, to uh, assure her of his pledge, a guarantee of his faithfulness, a promise of things to come. And it was also, the matan was, if it consisted of like jewelry, it was to make you look beautiful in, in preparing you for your wedding day. Also, it says um, that the spirit, in, and okay, so, so now that we see that, that, that what, what, what it was on the Mount Sinai, God was giving the Israelites a gift. Even the commandments were a gift from God, a way to live in that. So now let's just look at it like in the upper room, the matan, the gift of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It says the spirit, so this is the gift. It's, a, it's the same word, the gift. The Holy Spirit was a gift. It was a matan from the Lord. And it says the spirit is given as a sign of the bridegroom's love for the bride to encourage us in the days of our betrothal and separation, to assure us of his pledge, to bless us, to strengthen us, and to beautify us the guarantee of his faithfulness and the promise of things to come. The spirit is the matan, the gift of the bridegroom. That's why if you're wearing ladies, if you didn't get an engagement ring, there's some that are out there, not just moms, any ladies. The gift. The Holy Spirit is the gift. It's something that God wanted to deposit into us. Even some of the Jewish people say the gift. It's like it's the essence of God. If we think about the Holy Spirit, it's God's essence. It's, it's his presence. It was a gift. It was a down payment. But if we go before that part of, of the marriage ritual was, there was gifts, remember I said, but there was also a price. There was a price for a bride. And that was something that the, 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 the father of the bride and the groom and their families would negotiate. That... Just before all this on Passover, what do we see? That Jesus says that he, 
in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, it says, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Jesus paid the price for us as the bride, the ultimate price. He said, you are worth his very life. So not only did he give us the gift of the Holy Spirit, he paid the ultimate price. And every bride received that at that time. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, part of the story here I want you to be aware of is with, um, so Moses is having this encounter with the Lord up on top of Mount Sinai. And what does it say here? It says, when all the people saw the thunder, the lightning, and they heard the trumpets and they saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They, said, they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak for us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that, you, that, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. So sometimes we have those encounters with God. Sometimes we're afraid. We're like, I, I don't want to get too close to God. I, I don't want him to see the stuff that's inside of me. Or, you know, I'm, I'm afraid of those wacky people that roll around or get too radical. I mean, I think all of us could sometimes get afraid. And what ended up happening, God wanted to invite himself into them to speak to them. But they resisted that. They were afraid. So now they had to have a mediator to go between them and God. But that was never, when you're in a marriage, you don't want to have a mediator. You want to be able to look at your bride and the groom face to face, look into one another's eyes. But they were too afraid to do that. And at least, at least we see with the, the disciples, they were not like that. Okay, so, so going into more Jewish teaching here a little bit. So what we see is that, okay, so you have Passover and then you have Pentecost. Do you know that Pente Pentecost means 50? Because from Passover to Pentecost is 50 days. So that's what we see. We just celebrated our Passover and on June 5th, we will be celebrating um, Pentecost. So it's a 50-day thing. So what we've seen is what happened at that time was, let me get my scripture. Okay, this is really good. Okay, so we know that after Jesus, is, after he was, he was resurrected, it said that he walked around the face of the earth. And let's see what it says here. So Jesus, he walked around for 40 days. Remember on the road of Emmaus and different encounters that we see. It says in um, Acts chapter 1, let's see which one, maybe verse 3. It says, Jesus instructed them, don't leave. Now, again, this is Jesus in a resurrected body. So he's, he's been hanging out with them in a resurrected body for 40 days. And, and again, Jesus wanted to come. Now can we look and see that God wanted to marry the Israelites. He wanted to have an encounter with them, but they were afraid. And we see Thomas was kind of afraid. He had his moment too. I'm sure there were some of them that had their moments. Peter denied them. You know, we all have our moments. So here we have Jesus wants to be the bridegroom, and he wants to marry us, the church. So many stories in the Bible, you look at it, it's this constant parallel, the virgins and the oil and the banquet and it's just, it's a marriage celebration. We have to look at, at the gospel in that light. We are the bride of Christ. We need to understand the principles of the wedding. So it says, Jesus instructed them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait here until you receive the gift, the matan, I told you about, the gift the Father has promised. It says, yeah, that, so I guess that's, okay. So that, that's, that's what Jesus is telling them, to wait. So we're, we're, 40, we're 40 days into this 50-day window, and Jesus is telling them to wait. And Moses did the same thing. Moses went up the mountain, right, for his 40 days, and he told them to wait. But what happened? They saw the fire, they saw the smoke, and it got longer and longer. What did they begin to say? Oh, maybe he's dead, or, you know, all these scenarios. And they just decided to have a party. 
and to make some gods and have some orgies. I mean, that's what was going on in their waiting period. That's what they did. So we see with the disciples in their waiting period. So now we have what, what the disciples did. So they're in this waiting period. So here we see the ascension. It says, Jesus led the disciples. This is in Luke 24, 50. It says, Jesus led the disciples out of Bethlehem. He lifted up his hands over them. He blessed them in his love. While he was still speaking out words of love and blessing, he floated off the ground into the sky, ascending into the heavens before their very eyes. And they all could not, see, see, and they all could not, I'm sorry, and all they could do was worship him. Imagine, that would make total sense. It says, overwhelmed and ecstatic with joy, they made their way back to Jerusalem. Every day they went to the temple praising and worshiping God. So this is that 10 day, and that's what it's called for sometimes, 10 days of waiting. So, so many times we want, like, I want the gift, Lord. I, I want your gifts. I want this. But you know what? We get, we get discouraged. Like the Israelites, when Moses was on the mountain, this is taking too long. Maybe it's not good enough. Maybe it's not going to work in my life. And, and we, we lose, we get disheartened, and we go back to our old nature. But we see that the disciples, they had so many encounters. There were so many seeds that were placed within them that when they said to go and to wait, it said that every day they went to the temple. Because they knew if, if Jesus said, I have a gift, I have a baton for you, they didn't want to miss out on that. In church, we are in a season where God has many gifts for us. He has the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he wants to lavish his bride. And we see, what did it say? It said he wanted to give her gifts because he wanted her to know he's thinking of her. He's preparing a place for her. He loves her. Her. He wants to make her beautiful. He wants to encourage her that he is, he is, he's thinking of her every day, even though he's going, he's in heaven and he's preparing a place for us, but we are on his heart. And that's why he gives us different gifts. He gives us words of knowledge and healing and so many wonderful things. It's because he wants us to know I'm thinking of you. I want to give you gifts. While Jesus was still in his, in his uh, resurrected body, and he was with his disciples in John 20. It's funny. John 20, 22. What year are we in? 2022. John 20, 22. This is the year, church. This is the year. And this is what happened on John 20, 22. It says, it says, then taking a deep breath, he blew on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. God says this year, receive the matan, receive the gift. And so many times, if you don't know you have it coming, you don't go to the post office. You don't go, you don't wait, you don't get ready. Church, we need to be ready. We need to be ready. God is pouring out his gift on, on his bride. He loves us. He lavishes this on us. So we see that. Now, part of of the word too for gift. I'm going to go through, let's see, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 1 22. 2 Corinthians 1 22. And this is, again, this is pay attention to this gift thing. It says, Now it is God Himself who has anointed you, and He has constantly strengthened both you and us in union with Christ. Let me see. He knows we are His since we have also been stamped with his seal of love. So again, like a bride, you know, place me on my heart like a seal. I mean, that's what Jesus wants. He wants, he wants to be the seal of our heart. Why? Because he's our bridegroom. He wants us to be sealed. We, like the commandments, have no other gods before him. Place me like a seal over your heart. And he had given, it's, a, it's a, over our heart, and then he had given us the Holy Spirit like an engagement ring is given to a bride a down payment of the blessings to come. The Holy Spirit is our engagement ring. It's the promises of what is yet to come. And if we have that, that's what we can hold on to. Now, there's a Greek word, arbabon, 
In, in vines, it says, uh, arbon, it's, it's a pledge. It means to make a pledge or an earnest, um, a large part of a down payment given in advance as a security that the whole will be paid afterwards. So that's what we see this, this arbon, the, the engagement ring. It's a down payment, God is saying. This is a down payment that I promise that I am going to deliver you, I'm going to heal you, I'm going to set you free. Every time we, we, we feel God's presence in our life, we could just sit. This is only a little piece. This is only the down payment. So, so many times we look at Pentecost and we think, oh, you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that's all there is. That's only the down payment. That's only the engagement ring. There is so much more yet. There is so much more. So let's just think of the story. There's the, the matan, there's the gift. And remember, there was the price we learned about. Jesus gave the ultimate price. He gave his life for us so that no longer do we have to live the way we were. So you think of a bride when she is in her home. You know, we're, we're in this body. We're in this home right now. And maybe it's not so perfect. Maybe our bodies are hurting. You know, maybe we have relationships that are broken. You know, maybe, you know, we just... We just go through stuff like we all go through. We're all going through stuff. And we're in that home, but we remember Jesus paid the price so that we aren't going to always be in that home. God is preparing something better. He has something better for us. So don't, you know, it's one mindset when you say I'm stuck here and there's no hope. It's like, no, he paid the price that you do not have to stay in that broken home. The Israelites did not stay in slavery. They did not stay in Egypt. He brought them out. And what was their final thing? I'm taking them into a promised land I have for them. I have something better. And that's what he has for us. He fills us with the Holy Spirit as just a little down payment. And then he says, I have a promised land that I'm bringing you into. And along the way, I'm going to give you treats. I'm going to give you gifts. I'm going to give you prophetic words and visions and dreams. But can you position your heart to receive that? Can you be like the disciples that waited the 10 days? They waited and they went to prayer because they know God says, I have a gift for you. And we see that day, there was tongues of fire. There was pillars. And we, let's just read what was happening that day in Acts. Acts 2.1, on the day of Pentecost, First Pentecost was Mount Sinai. Remember the fire? Remember the trembling? Remember the awe of God? That's what the Lord has. This is the season that we're in right now, church. It says, as it was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place. Suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from, from the heavenly realm. You know, again, they, they read the story of Mount Sinai. They heard of this. They're like, oh my goodness. Remember when God wanted to talk to us face to face and all the Israelites were scared? Well, you know what? He, he found out we're not scared. He said, it's okay. I'm going to come into the room. I'm going to fill the room with the fire and the pillar and the, the groaning and, it, and the trumpets. That's what it said. It just, everything got bigger and stronger and more powerful. It says that, that suddenly they heard all of the sounds, violent blasts, winds uh, rushing into the house from uh, the heavenly realm. The roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was uh, so much that people could not bear it. And what they said is even the blast of the wind, it said that it was, it was almost the sound, the, the roar of a groaning spirit. I go to a lot of prayer meetings. I love prayer. And you know what? There's a lot of groaning going on in those rooms. Can we say that's God's moving? That's his spirit? His wind coming up, and he's groaning. He's in the room. And that's a normal feeling when you feel that groaning. God is birthing something. That's his spirit coming on us, and we're groaning in the spirit. That's what happened in the book of Acts. There was groaning as in birthing. And he does it today, church. He does it today. It says the, the roar of the wind was so overpowering that it was almost unbearable. Then all at once a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. They were all filled. All. Can we all say all? All. all. God has the matan. He has the gift. 
for everyone. There was 120, and 120 got filled that day. It filled, it, it, and it said that it filled them, and it equipped them. Church, we need to be equipped. And I love that. That's what my pastor, you know, Pastor Chris, he's always saying, this is an equipping center, because that's what the Holy Spirit does. And if we let God's Spirit come here, he's going to equip us. So whatever we're going through, we need to feel equipped, or we just need more, more of the Holy Spirit in us. That's all. It says, so the Holy Spirit, um, he engulfed, they were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit. They were inspired to speak in tongues. They were empowered by the Spirit to speak languages they have never learned before. That was the Pentecost there that God did because they waited. They waited those 10 days and they believed that God was going to do that. I wanted to read in um, 2 Corinthians 5, 5, 5 what it talks about here. And it says, and this is no empty hope, for God himself is the one who has prepared us for this wonderful destiny. You know, God's prepared each of you for a wonderful destiny. No one's left out on this journey. Everyone is invited in. And to confirm the promise, he has given us the Holy Spirit, like an engagement ring, as a guarantee. God is guaranteeing each of us the, the, the wonderful hope that we could have. And it says after that, in verse 6, it says, that's why we always are full of courage. We, if, if we don't have courage, we just need more of Jesus. Yeah. Go get more of Jesus because that's what he is. He infills us with that courage because that's who he is. Let's see, I wanted to read. Um, okay, Ephesians 1.14. And it says here, now we have been stamped with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. Again, we just, we just need to realize the language. We've been stamped. We've been sealed. He's placed us like over our hearts. He is given to us like an engagement ring is given to a bride as the first installment of what is to come. There's more to come. There's more to come. Position ourselves. There's more to come. He is our hope, our promise of a future inheritance, which seals us until we have all the redemption promises, all the redemptive promises, all of them. None of us have arrived in this room. We're all being redeemed. We're all being set free. We're all on this journey. If we're not, if we're not there, ask, seek, be willing to wait. Until we're in that upper room and everybody is filled, everybody's touched. God doesn't miss out on anybody. God wants all of us. So we are waiting for God's full redemptive promises for our lives. And what does that look like? That looks like hope. That looks like courage. That looks like healing. That looks like victory. That looks like overcomers. That it doesn't matter what's going on out there. It only matters what's going on in here. Because that's what God wor is worried about. He's worried about us. He's worried about filling us with all the promises, all the redemption, that we will not, not lack any good thing, that we will be more than enough, that we will be overcomers. And if we feel weak, then he is strong. Yeah. It even says that his spirit, it's, it's in Proverbs, it says his spirit sustains us in times of sickness. There, there, God's spirit, God's presence will sustain us, but we need to press into that. It's our job to wait. It's our job to press in. If we're not where we want to be, then we just need to press. We need to wait. We need to linger. But hunger, hunger is something that somebody can't give you. That's something you have to have. And I want to I wanna put that in your spirit this morning. I want to make you hungry to know that the, 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 the groom, that Jesus, our beautiful groom, he wants us to be his beautiful bride. He wants us to be adorned with, with gifts. I mean, and then you, you read about that, about the, the, the gifts of the Spirit. That's for the bride. That's to make you beautiful. And we even see about that. It says, um, even in Ephesians uh, 17, it talks about, it says, um, it says, I pray that the Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, would impart to you the riches of the Spirit of wisdom we're lacking wisdom, there's a spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know him through your, uh, through deepening intimacy with him, deepening intimacy with him. 
I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination. Isn't that beautiful? Asking God, Lord, illuminate my eyes. Give me eyes to see. Isn't it great? Like nowadays they have these night vision goggles, you know, that you could wear and you could see. Say, God, I need a pair of those to go into the spiritual realm. Illuminate my eyes so that I could see into the spiritual realm. It says that you, you, your imagination flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling that is the wealth of God's glory, his inheritance that he finds for us, his holy ones. There's an inheritance that we each have. It says, I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. So this does, what does it say? According to your faith, let it be done to you. I see that with people. You know, I'll try to pray for them, and I'm like, well, what do you want to believe for? Well, you know, I need to make it through the week. You know, I, I just got to make it through the week. I'm like, that's a low bar. That's a low bar. You know, why don't you get, get, sit there and just say that, you, you know, you want to lead five people to the Lord. You want to raise the dead this week. This is the week I'm going to raise somebody for the dead. You know, you might take a thousand tries, but at least that's my bar. Because that's what God's word says. My standards are the word of God, not my experiences. God's word is truth and everyone else will be a liar. But we need to sit there and, and, and pray according to our faith. And that's what it's saying. It's like, according to your faith, let it be done. So that's our part. Hunger is our part. Faith is our part. And God meets us in that. It says, then after that, through your faith, then it says, then your lives will be an advertisement. Who wants to be an advertisement? Of the immense power at work through you. We'll be an advertisement for Jesus. That's what we need to do. Just so you know, I'm reading a lot out of the Passion Translation. I really love the Passion Translation, if you haven't noticed. But our lives will be an advertisement for God's power in our lives. As we walk in faith, as we walk in hunger, as we wait for what God is going to do. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes people might think I'm a little bit radical here. I'm going to tell you a little of my story. I came from a very broken home. My dad left when I was young. My mom was a bartender who could care more about guys than, ki than his, her kids. There was drugs. There was immorality. We were on the other side of the tracks, and everybody let us know we were there. Didn't have much hope. I just wanted to make it. I was sexually abused was abandoned many times as my mom got rid of me. <laughs> then my dad got saved, <laughs> and I went to visit him. Usually when I would visit my dad, he would give me drugs, but this time he gave me Jesus. <laughs> he took me to a tent meeting <laughs> where they didn't talk about Jesus. Jesus was there. And as I sat in the back, I began to mock them as Christians. I said, they're weak people, just need a crutch. My heart was so hard. Next thing I know, they have an altar call at the end. And I'm up in front, accepting Jesus. I don't know how I got from the back row to the front. I don't know how that happened, but I was there, and Jesus was there. And I had a counter with Jesus that I'll forever change my life. Amen. From not feeling like I had a place to belong, not feeling loved, feeling abandoned. All of a sudden, I felt wanted, and I felt loved, and I felt like I had hope. And in my mind, you know, I was going to compensate for everything. I was going to go to college, and I was going to make money, and then I would feel good about myself. Well, at that moment, all that stuff didn't matter anymore. All the plans that... I wanted to have, all I wanted to do was know more about this Jesus. So at that time, they didn't encourage, they didn't encourage about being, being baptized in water, but I started going to a church, and they, they were going to do baptism. So I got baptized, and they water baptized me, and then not long after that, they had a traveling evangelist showed up, and he had all of us come forth, and he began to pray for everybody. 
And he laid hands on me. And the fire of God, it was just a little teeny Assembly of God church in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And the fire of God, just like they talk about, with tons of fire, came over me. And I couldn't talk in English all night long. I was only talking in tongues. I was shaking. And I had an encounter with God that forever changed my life, and he's never left. He's never left. And I'm not saying my life has been very hard. I deal with a lot of stuff, but Jesus is so good. It says when we're weak, he is strong. And that was my encounter that I had. And that's why I'm, I'm so radical, and that's why I want everyone to have that. I want everyone to know God's power that he could take a broken person. And it's been a process. It's been such a process. When you go through that level of trauma, it's a, it's a process of going through trauma. Thank you. When all you've known is at any moment you could be given away because you're an inconvenience. It takes a long time to go through that. Not feeling loved, not feeling wanted, not feeling valued. But the more I stayed with Jesus, the more he let me know that I was loved and I was wanted. And he had a plan for me. And he gave me that engagement ring. He gave me his Holy Spirit. And when I felt defiled because I was molested, didn't feel like I had any value, he made me feel pure again. He made me feel like I could have a hope again, that I could... One day, somebody can love me. One day, I'll be able to have children. All the fears that I had from so much abuse. But the Holy Spirit would just keep coming. God would keep speaking to me. He would speak to every lie. He was my engagement ring of the promises that were ahead. And it was like, I'm going to keep going. But so many times, so many times I could have gotten tripped up. There was my family members, you know, when they're, they're crazy, it's just, they're crazy. And you never know what's going to happen. And, and it just do crazy things. And you don't know what's going to happen. And it's like I had to choose that I'm with Jesus. And it doesn't matter what's coming at me at all sides. It doesn't matter. It's what's inside of me. Jesus is inside of me. I'm going to keep focused. So we all have our stuff. But we have our promises from God. He has unimaginable plans and purposes for each of us. But we just have to keep focused on that. We have to keep our faith. We have to keep our hunger. We have to keep waiting on the Lord. And he will. He'll overcome every obstacle in your life. It might be a miracle that this, you're healed. Or it might be by your, by, he tells me, by my stripes, you're healed. Now walk it out. I'm like, okay, God. I'm going to walk it out. Some days it hurts, but I'm going to walk it out. Right, Harold? Because we know <clears throat> that God's our healer. <clears throat> so that's the encouragement. Michael, if you can come. So we see that when the spirit of the Lord fell, it was the down payment of something so great that's ahead. Church, we are in the most exciting time. We are going in to the Pentecost. God always does things according to his calendar. June 5th is Pentecost. This was the season when Jesus walked in the resurrected body. I feel him. He's here. Ten days before, ten days, they waited and they waited. Can we wait? Are we going to be like the Israelites on Mount Sinai? Go make some idols because it's taking too long. I mean, I hear you. I, I've been there. It seems like it's taken too long. But you know what? The journey's pretty fun. The journey's really fun. Because I'll tell you, days you can't make it, Jesus said, oh, yes, you can. And he speaks truth into our lives. I know that Jesus is here today. And I'm believing just like he met me at the altar that day. And release the power of God in my life that forever changed a lost, hopeless, broken girl 
And he filled me with his promises and he gave me his engagement ring and he set me free from so much garbage, just instantly set me free and gave me hope. It gave me joy. He wants to do that for you because that's what testimonies are. So we're going to worship the Lord and I'm going to give you an opportunity to come to the altar and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for God to encounter you and to allow you to walk in the freedom of his promises as a bride and he's going to adorn you with all of his beauty.